for participants on the line. Welcome again, everyone. I am very pleased to be able to present Tom Greenaway. He is a doctoral student in the UK. He's got an interesting story to tell. I have enjoyed working with him setting up this webinar. And I'm very curious to hear what he has to say. This webinar is being recorded so that you know, and the, the recording will be available on the YouTube channel shortly following the end of the webinar. You will also be receiving a follow-up email tomorrow with the link to the recording and a link to a feedback form. We'd love to hear what you think about the webinar. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Tom. He'll tell you a little bit more about it himself and what's going on with the LGBTQ SIG in Zyatar. Tom, over to you. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, this is my first webinar, so I hope it goes well. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, LGBTQ people in cultural spaces. Um, so the plan is, um, I'm just going to talk about the relevance of LGBTQ issues and culture and intercultural communication for trainers, researchers, and uh, general interculturalists. Uh, then you're going to learn more about the SIG, or Special Interest Group, which was recently set up at CETA Europa to discuss LGBTQ issues. And then I'm going to invite you to join the discussion how we can advance uh, scholarship and thought leadership on LGBTQ issues globally. So just a bit about me. Um, here's a photo if you can't see my face in the video. Um, so I'm currently a researcher at the University of Sheffield. Um, yeah, I'm also a doctoral student. I've passed, I've defended my PhD, but I've still got to do the revisions. Um, I did my PhD and I did a master's in intercultural communication at the University of Warwick. And in terms of living abroad, I've lived and worked in Japan and Martinique as an English teacher. So that's kind of to give you a flavor of my intercultural experiences. And I'm also a gay British male, which I don't know if that necessarily qualifies me to talk about all of LGBTQ experiences, but it kind of gives me an insight to some of them. So um, just to give you an idea of where this came, of how this came about, um, Last year, I was at CETA Europa in Dublin, um, and I met a guy called Joel Brown. We actually uh, just happened to sit next to each other at the conference dinner on the final night. I don't know if anyone watching was there, um, but we were just getting to know each other, and then we both started talking about our partners. And um, then we kind of talked about how we thought it was strange that there wasn't much about LGBTQ issues at the conference or really generally when you talk about intercultural communication or cross-cultural communication, how, uh, this is Joel, kind of how LGBTQ issues overlap with it. And there is a lot of overlap, but it seemed to us that no one was really talking about it. So we decided, we talked and decided to collaborate and that eventually led to um, Setting, setting up this group and there's going to be a, a, a group, a similar group in America as well, hopefully, um, to kind of create a space for LGBTQ interculturalists or people who are interested in inclusion and diversity in intercultural communication, which I'm sure most people are. So just, um, I wasn't sure what type of people would be watching this, how, um, how much they might know about the LGBTQ community or even the letters. So I think most people know the first four letters. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual. And then Q can mean queer or questioning. And questioning can mean that, you know, you're not really sure about your sexual identity or your gender identity. And queer is also used as an umbrella term instead of LGBTQ. Um, although again, queer can also mean a slur in some communities, so it's not always used. And then, um, not to talk too much about this, but there are other letters in the spectrums. In some, there's 10 or 11 letters, which include asexuals or intersex or undefined, uh, which is similar to questioning, but not the same. But um, 
if you're not an initiate, you don't need to, you probably won't um, hear much about them, although they are still important parts of the community. But I'm not going to really talk about those ex experiences of those people at this, um, in this webinar. So LGBTQ issues and LGBT culture and intercultural communication. One of the questions that we had when we were talking about this is why is it relevant? And how, um, how do these two themes connect? Um, and for us, it was kind of obvious, but then when I talked to a few people, they didn't seem to quite, didn't seem clear to them why it was important for LGBTQ issues to think about, for LGBTQ people to be relevant to intercultural communication and vice versa. And one of the things that um, any person who belongs to this community, when they think about going abroad, either to live or work, or just on holiday, they look at maps about the region that they're going to. Um, so here's one map. Um, and just in the comment threads, can anyone guess um, what this is a map of? Go ahead and type your responses in the chat window. What does this map represent? So same-sex legal, blue, illegal, red, map of gay-friendly areas, forbidden. Okay. Yeah, so most people are saying... Blue-friendly, red attention. Blue-friendly, red attention. That's an interesting way of putting it. That's probably the closest. So these are, these are countries, the countries in blue are the ones who, at the UN, they support, they tend to support for, for the promotion of LGBTQ rights. Whereas if the ones in red generally don't support them, and then the ones in gray have a mixed, have a mixed record. So for example, it's interesting that Russia, you would think is generally um, politically against LGBTQ rights, but they have a mixed record. Whereas Pakistan is in red, but Pakistan just recently voted to end uh, discrimination against trans people in the workplace even though homosexuality is still illegal there, or homosexual acts are still illegal there. But you see these maps, there's all sorts of them. Um, so this is one from Europe. Um, and this was a recent survey by Expert Market. Um, and it's the best countries to live and work in, in Europe if you're LGBTQ. And you, know, you might be surprised to see that Belgium and the Netherlands um, didn't get uh, the top ranking um, and I found it quite interesting as well because the UK has gone down in recent years probably due to um, Brexit and homophobia that's come out of that as well as other um, tensions towards minorities um, and then here's one with America so if you're an American or going to live or work in America and you are a member of this community you think um, what states will I be able to work in? Where, which states is it safe to come out to my boss? And then also um, countries in Asia where same-sex activity is legal. So here's another map if you're going to Asia or in Africa where they have a very mixed picture of being illegal, being legal, you know, giving you the death penalty, whether it's protected. And some of this kind of seems just like a political phenomenon. But actually, the way that laws are in a country has an impact on the LGBT, LGBTQ culture there. And also the way that um, individuals go into that country or who already live in that country or remember this community, how they act. So to give you an example, in the UK, um, LGBTQ culture used to be very much um, suppressed. And it was illegal in the UK until 1968 to, I think it was 1968, to, for, for men to have sex. And that meant that the gay male culture was quite distinctive and it had its own language or dialect called Polari. And you have similar, thing, similar things in other cultures across the world where being LGBTQ but being in a very repressive society for those things means that you have a different culture, a different cultural understanding. So there's that aspect. But also if you're someone who's going abroad and you're a member of this community, 
you'll be looking at what the culture is like there, what the laws are like. Can I come out to people? Um, will other people come out to me? What type of relationship can I have with people there if I'm a member of this community? And it kind of, when I was thinking about how to conceptualize this, I was thinking about what are the barriers to intercultural communication? How do they relate to people from the LGBTQ community? And so Yant has several different factors that he sees as barriers to intercultural communication. One is anxiety. And I've already kind of summarized how if you're going to a country where the laws are oppressive, you will feel anxious about um, coming out, even if it's not. So even in the UK, a relatively open country, um, I still feel anxious about who I come out to. And like the fact is that in advertising this webinar, and this webinar will come on YouTube, I'm basically coming out to uh, members of CETA Europa, but also to the internet. And um, that is quite anxious. And it's also um, carries some risks. Um, another barrier is assuming similarities instead of differences. So one common thing that you experience if you're a member of this community is that um, people who don't know that you are a member of the LGBT community, they assume that you're straight. They assume that you're a heterosexual and that you kind of follow all the norms that should go along with that. So that you have, you're married, you have kids, um, you know, you do, you do the things that regular heterosexual couples and people do. And often it may be, particularly if you're in a country where they're not used to people being open about their sexuality, they may have very um, old stereotypes or very kind of, um, very strong prejudices against you if you're a part of that community, which you have to negotiate if you're going to that country or if you meet someone from that country in your workplace or in your daily life. Another thing that um, a barrier is ethnocentrism, which is similar to a similar, assuming similarities instead of differences for LGBTQ people. But there's also an element of um, some countries they'll say, oh, gay people don't exist in my country, or there aren't any gay people in my country. And this is assumption that if you're from this culture or if you're from this country, then there aren't people from the LGBT community in it. Um, which is a lie, but it's still um, important. And then stereotypes and prejudices come up a lot. Um, and they're something which people in the LGBT community have had to deal with in their own countries and wherever you go, um, whether it's, so for example, when I first came up, my mum thought I would suddenly like to go clothes shopping because that's what gay people like to do apparently, um, or gay men like to do, which was completely false and I still don't like clothes shopping. But that, that was the stereotype. Um, and then nonverbal misinterpretations. So for example, if you come out to someone and then, so they know, so if I was to come out to another male and then they may think that my smiling at them is some sort of, um, could be interpreted the wrong way. It could be interpreted that I'm coming onto them or something, just because they're not used to like suddenly they've met, they met someone outside of their comfort zone. And so they're going to interpret things quite differently in particular nonverbal misinterpretations. And the other thing is language problems. So I've already talked about Polari, but um, depending on how much familiarity you have with being LGBTQ. So for example, trans people, um, you have to use the correct pronouns, whether it's he or she or they. So some people prefer gender neutral pronouns and so that can cause problems. And that's something within an LGBTQ culture. But then also um, some cultures will have code words to kind of find out more about you, including your relationship status, your sexuality and so on. And if you're new to that culture, you have to learn these things. And so just to be specific about some of the issues that interculturalists face, one is coming out. Um, and this can be coming out who you come out to. It can be when you come out to someone. So for example, do you tell everyone straight away? And then if you're in a new workplace or a new country, how do you know what's appropriate to say or when it's appropriate to, to say it? 
Another thing is staying in. So you may decide that I'm going to a completely repressive country or in a repressive community. And you may decide this isn't a place where I want to come out. But then there are other issues. So say, for example, I may have a work profile or a social media page which has pro LGBTQ content or has pictures of my partner who's the same sex as me. Do I have to suppress that before going abroad? Or if I suppress, if I don't suppress it, would that limit my job opportunities in other countries? Another issue if you're a uh, transsexual is transitioning. So say for example, you may be in the middle of transitioning and a work opportunity comes up, or you may in a country where um, they're not used to trans people, or maybe that you're traveling abroad or you want to travel abroad. And it's not just the prejudices that you may face, but it could also be medical issues. It could be, um, could be professional issues. And I've got a vignette about this later, which we can discuss. And dealing, the other issue is dealing with prejudice. Um, so a lot of cultures are prejudiced towards LGBTQ people. And a lot of, and it's not just the culture, it can be indiv it's individuals within a population. I recently saw a video uh, Russia, which has a stereotype of being quite anti-LGBTQ, but this was a guy who had a sign saying, hug me, I'm gay, and he got loads of hugs, and only one or two people weren't happy with what he did. And this was in Moscow, and then again, you have city and rural, and dealing with prejudices in different um, contexts. And then also refugee and asylum issues. So one of the things that I'm going to share with you at the end of uh, this webinar is a Word document which has links to different articles and organizations that talk about being LGBTQ and in different cultures. And one of them is this group in Russia. They're an LGBT group in Russia who offer services to refugees from Syria who are also of the LGBT community because their problems and the struggles that they face being LGBTQ and finding their way in Turkey will be quite different to how it was in Syria for them. And they may not want to um, learn, you know, learn things from the, the mainstream Turkish community. They may want to just stay within an LGBTQ space where they feel safe. So I'm just going to show you a video of something that kind of inverts the idea of coming out. Um, it's from a, a recent film called Love, Simon. And um, I just, I'll show it to you and I'll just see what you think. It's part of their lives and it's not just, you don't just come out once, you come out multiple times to friends, family, co-workers, new workplaces, people in different countries, um, people in different professions and it's something that seems quite funny and that if you're heterosexual, the idea of having to tell people I'm straight may seem quite funny, but actually it's something that for LGBTQ people, it's very important. And, um, I've yeah. been thinking, sorry. And then this has implications in all sorts of areas into called communication. So, and one of them is coaching. And so one of the things you can think about when you're coaching is, Say, for example, you're coaching a room of people who are about to go to another country. Do you include a section on LGBTQ issues in the destination country organization or community? You may include something on, for example, what it's like to be a woman in that country or what it's like to be in a certain city of that country or a certain religion in that country. But you don't know if the people in the, in the room, whether when you're coaching them, you don't know if they're part of the LGBT community and what's kind of more uh, adds more tension is they may not want to tell you, but you still may want to include information about it. Um, another aspect is, do you reveal your own uh, sexual or gender identity? Even if you are um, straight or a cis, which is the opposite of trans, if you're cisgender, do you say I am, you know, a straight cis male? Um, I mean, you may not think it's relevant, but when you talk, when you coach, you often say who you are, you say where you're from. You may talk about um, if you're married or if you've got, per you may talk about your personal experiences raising kids in another country. 
um, do you talk about these things? Um, it's not, there's no definitive answer to this question or the question um, before, but it's something that you need to think about. Do you include LGBTQ culture as a theme when you talk about cultural differences? So often when we give case studies to people when we're talking about um, cultural differences, we'll say, you know, maybe the Chinese person met the French person and they had this misunderstanding over this present, which was a watch. Um, you know, because in China you don't give people presents, you don't give people watches as presents. Would you talk about uh, misunderstandings between um, LGBTQ people and non-LGBTQ people? Can you add culture to it? And actually you can. Um, so here's a vignette, which I'll just give you a few. Tom, yeah. can, can I interrupt with a couple questions? Sure. Before we go to the vignette. Veronica asks, is there a risk in some countries just being labeled as LGBT plus, even if you live a stereotypical straight life while in that country? Yeah. Um, and it's, there isn't, I don't think there's some countries, it's all countries. So for example, um, there are cases in America where teenagers have committed suicide because everyone in their class has said that they were gay and whether or not they were um, is unknown, but they have anyway, mm -hmm. suicide. You risk uh, social, uh, being ostracized socially if you're labeled as part of this community in many different groups. Uh, you could be considered guilty by association if you support LGBTQ issues. Um, but even if you're not a member of that community, but you're what's called an ally, um, you could still face repercussions for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And another question, which I'm curious about this, is when you have conducted intercultural training or coaching and included sections on LGBTQ issues, what kinds of conversations have ensued? Uh, it depends. Some, so some sessions have been different to others. So in some sessions people have engaged with it and there has been a conversation and it's been, so for example, one, one area which I often talk about for people who don't identify as part of the community is that, for example, if you're a Westerner going into a country where it's restricted uh, to be LGBTQ, someone from that country may come out to you just because they think you're a Western and you may be more open-minded about it, which may be true and probably is true, but then you have to carry their secret. And then how do you negotiate that? So for example, you could then be out socially with them and a few other work colleagues and the talk could then be about, you know, getting, you know, having kids or getting a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever. And you know that that person is uncomfortable, but you can't really do anything except change the topic of the conversation to make them feel, um, you know, that they're not being, that they're not feeling more comfortable. But then other groups where I've shown these things, people have just kind of listened quietly and then we've moved on to the next area. Mm -hmm. So it can, engagement it depends really on the audience and on the, on the group. So even within intercultural training, it can be awkward, uncomfortable for some groups. Yeah, and I think I think it's perfectly understandable because um, LGBT issues have only really become acceptable to talk about openly in the past, I don't know, fifteen years. Mm. Well, in the UK, in my experience, um, and even now, it's only been the last five years where I felt that people can openly can embrace embrace it. Um, in public, because the attitude before used to be one of either let them kind of deal with their own thing or, you know, not positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So yes, folks, if you have questions, just pop them into the chat window and we'll get to them. Okay, thank you, Tom. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, that's fine. So I'm now going to share a vignette, um, which is from a book which um, I'm going to include the PDF in a shareable Google file um, at the end of this. 
And it's quite a good book about um, discrimination in the workplace and in intercultural workplaces. And this particular chapter has um, vignettes, not just if you're from the LGBTQ community, but if you're a woman, um, if you're old, so ageism. And they're pretty good. I think they're pretty good dis discussion points for training. So it's called Caught Between a Rock and a Hard Place. So I'll just give you two minutes, two or three minutes to read it. And then at the end of it, I want you to kind of in the chat, just suggest what you might do or my, what advice you might give. Okay. Yeah, so just in the chat section, just think about, give some ideas about what you might do. You can talk about and discuss the decision, but it seems to be, but, but it has to be accepted anyway. You can't change the whole culture of the country and the company. So what has to be accepted anyway? Is that the, the trans person or is that Is that the um, the 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 re repatriation? The repatriation decision. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? From my experiences, Allison underestimated going to Kuwait as a trans person. Yeah. That's probably true. If I were if I was trans, I probably would be more careful. Um, yeah, but then you may you may kind of think that uh, she may have thought that no one would notice because um, Alison felt her gender had been affirmed, so that um, means most likely that she felt that she presented outwardly as a woman and felt inwardly as a woman. Um, in terms of repatriation, yeah, I mean, it would depend in this context, it seems that Alison is still quite junior in the firm, so she may not be so important to the business loss. But um, if they were more senior, then there may be a problem. And also, the other question is that money talks. 
So if there's a lot of money coming one way or the other way, that could have an impact on it. Are there any other comments? Uh, it's an opportunity for the employer to talk about cultural differences. What is considered acceptable, what is not, and why. But can imagine it's really not easy to do that in Kuwait. Yeah, that's true. Um, they could provide a difference of, so what's culturally acceptable within Kuwait and what's culturally acceptable within the company that they're working for. Um, because there could be a tension between them. Um, yeah. Another comment. As a cis person, I would talk with Alice. If some of the employees are open, then it might work. However, if the more powerful employees are negative, then it could be a problem. Yeah, that's good. So power dynamics. Um, if, the bo if your boss or the lead person that you're working with isn't happy with, with you, then um, your options are be more limited. Yeah. Um, another comment. I, I wonder about two of the Kuwaiti nationals did not respond well. How many were there in total in the group? Uh, that's a good question. It's not in the vignette. Mm -hmm. so, um, that would be something that you could explore in the discussion as well. I was also wondering about, and you referred to that in a moment ago, Tom, is how was it revealed that she was or is trans? Well, presumably, if the two Kuwaiti men don't want a man impersonating a woman, it could be that um, Alison uh, didn't appear as outwardly female as uh, was convincing. Um, for example, um, transition surgery, even though it can be very convincing in um, in some cases, in other cases, um, it still may not be completely effective in kind of giving an outward appearance of a change in identity. Change mm -hmm. in and this is something that's talked about in the trans community a lot because um, particularly in America, depending on how much money you have, can all your family has, uh, can have an impact on how much access you have to transition surgery, to gender reassignment surgery, and the plastic surgery that comes that kind of goes with it. Okay. Another come up. Perhaps get a more senior Kuwaiti stakeholder or employee to step up as an ally in model acceptance. Yeah, good. I like that. Yeah. Um, if you have a senior person who says this isn't an issue, you shouldn't make an issue out of it, then that might uh, work, particularly if uh, it's a hierarchical country, which I've never been to Kuwait, but I'm sure there it could be a powerful, um, a powerful way of convincing people. Mm -hmm. Another comment. I believe that two men complaining could probably have an influence on the rest of the group. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So if two people are negative about it, then they encourage other people to be negative about it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's already been quite a few comments, which is good because it shows that um, this kind of vignette could be effective in getting people to think about LGBTQ issues in different countries. I mean, one thing is kind of the position of Alison here. So she's working in a classroom with people who don't want to study under her. And it's kind of, is it her job to defend herself against, against this, to, um, to affirm her identity again? Because she's probably had to go through the life of convincing people that she's a woman. Um, is it the job of the boss to defend her? Um, is it, yeah, so there are lots of different issues about it. And I think it's quite a good way of getting conversations about LGBTQ issues when you're working, living or working abroad. So I'll just move on um, to talk a bit more about the special interest group, which is 
what we've um, launched recently and the main aims of it. So we have three main aims, um, which I've got in the whole bullet points here. Um, hang on. So the first one is to advance scholarship and thought leadership on LGBTQ issues globally. And so part of this is about research, but also about um, how to think about LGBTQ, LGBTQ issues in different countries and across the world. Another is to support and advance the unique or specific needs of LGBTQ interculturalists, especially as it pertains to professional development, inclusion and safety. And so, for example, in the vignette you just saw, you have an LGBTQ interculturalist, whether she likes it or not, she's in QH, she's an interculturalist. Um, and this relates to her inclusion in the workplace and also her safety. And to provide a non-competitive forum for LGBTQ interculturalists and other diversity and inclusion practitioners to, that should be, to for fellowship and to share suggested practices and build community. So, um, and part of this is having an online presence, which is, we have a website, which will be shared with you at the end of the webinar. Um, but also we're going to create a mailing list and try and create some discussion groups where people can talk about these issues and share practices. So if you're thinking about getting involved and wondering how you could get involved, there are various ways. So one is to help organize events in local national CTARs with an LGBTQ theme. So um, each LGBT, each um, CTAR group country um, has their own small conferences um, where something could be arranged for this or there could be a presence or a breakout session. Another is to contribute blog posts and short articles with an LGBTQ and intercultural focus. Um, and I think a lot of people have experience of these if they're part of the community or even if they're just interculturalists generally. Uh, one thing that we're aiming to do for the CETA Europe conference in 2019, which I believe is in Belgium, is to have an LGBTQ stream. So have a few presentations about, uh, which are on LGBTQ issues and intercultural issues. And to share experiences in an LGBTQ SIG forum, SIG is the special interest group. And to conduct research or research or research collaborations in this area, because one thing isn't just to extend practice, but also to conduct research about the experiences of LGBTQ interculturalists and how their life is for them when they live and work abroad in different countries. And how to find us. So we have a WordPress website, um, which was set up by CETA Europa, and we've also got a mailing list, and we're planning to send out monthly emails. But for the website, you can contribute blog posts, or if you've already written blog posts, you could just share them with us and we can post them for you so you get more coverage. Um, and if you want to help with the mail, emails or organizing events you can contact us so my email address is there thomas.w.greeno at gmail.com and joel who is my american collaborator is also there um yeah um yeah i think that's everything if you go on the website there's more information about the origin of this and how it came about um because there used to be an american group in the 90s using a Yahoo group, but they didn't have a lot of um, visibility. So we're creating a group that's slightly more visible and with slightly different aims. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we now have plenty of time for questions or comments. Okay. Uh, Steve, are you there?
sorry, I was on mute. Oh, okay. So, uh, George says, we'd be happy to explore sharing events using our new gender and sexual identity diversify game. And he gives the link there. So, thank you, George. Um, could you discuss a few ideas how allies can help? Okay. Um, so, one area where allies can help is um, kind of getting involved. I think getting involved with a special interest group and learning more about LGBTQ issues. It's difficult to be able to offer specific help unless you have a specific situation. But um, one of the areas where allies can really help is just by being visible. Um, so if you're in an organization or if you're helping an organization, just be visible that you, you know, you're know, you someone who's happy to talk about LGBTQ issues and you're someone who supports kind of their rights in the workplace or kind of their, um, you like, you supports that, that they are listened to in their organization. And being visible is a very important thing because, for example, I work in quite a big organization at Sheffield University. And one of the great things is um, we have these lanyards which are rainbow shaped. They're not rainbow shaped, they're rainbow colored. And anyone who's wearing them is someone who's gone on this training course about diversity and inclusivity, particularly for LGBTQ people. And so I know if anyone's wearing that lanyard and I've got an issue, I can go to them for help. And they're quite visible all across the university. So having things like that are really quite useful. Just follow on to that comment. Do you think that it is necessary or desirable to have training specifically oriented towards gender diversity? Or is it enough to include it in general intercultural training? That's a good question. I think it depends on how deep you're going to go. So say, for example, if you've only got a day or a few hours to, to deliver a session, you probably can't do that much on it. Whereas if you're delivering a, a program, uh, like a, you know something that lasts for a week or a month, um, which I know is quite rare, but happens more in uh, academic situations perhaps, then I think it is important um, to, to include more of a, to have a specific session on, on LGBTQ. Uh, it's themes and intercultural communication. And we've got a request. Could you go back one slide so that the web address and mailing list address is visible? Yeah, um, they're going to be shared with you afterwards. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, you don't have to write it down now if you don't. If, because um, like the subscribe mailing list link is really long. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yes, you will get all of these links and the links to the documents that Tom referenced earlier in the follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, does question does CETA collect data on the sexual orientation and gender identity of its members? I'm curious whether LGBTQ folks are more or less likely to gravitate towards an intercultural interculturalist role than the non-LGBTQ population or any other data sources that might provide answers? Hmm, interesting question. Yeah, I don't know whether CTAC collects data on sexual orientation. As far as I know, I wasn't asked when I became a member of CTAR anywhere about my sexual orientation. Um, in terms of whether LGBTQ folks are more or less likely to gravitate towards an interculturalist role, the non-LGBTQ population. I can't give a specific answer about that. My feeling is that um, because being part of the LGBTQ community in some way is like being a minority and it's like, it's a bit like being bicultural. And those people who are minorities and people who are bicultural often, or I would say tend to have more of an interculturalist role because they will often be in a position where they're explaining one community to an out, they're explaining their community to an outsider or explaining or an outsider, you know, they are, they're often kind of in a middle position. So, so yeah, so your hypothesis that LGBTQ folks have a personal experience 
that translates into easily into, into an intercultural role. I think to some extent that's true, although you know there are you know there are people who are LGBTQ who can still be quite shut off, and racism within particularly the gay male community is quite common. Um, and there have been you know quite a few reports about that. So it's I would say yes, but not not always. Yeah, plus it depends on the role as well that they're, they're in. Yeah, the comment when I'm uh, supporting yours, Tom, my hypothesis is that LGBTQ folks have personal experience that translates easily into an interculturalist role. Another comment. I am very happy about this initiative. I am a volunteer for AFS Intercultural Programs and a special interest group on LGBT called Queer Exchange. We've been working on those topics for eight years and I'm always happy to exchange experiences, material, and knowledge on those topics. Oh, great. Yeah, there are a few organizations out there. There's one that I've been in contact with in Australia um, that yeah, talks about LGBTQ issues in an intercultural way. What's AFS? Yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit more about AFS? Waiting for a response here. Okay. American Field Service. It's basically doing student exchanges, okay, in 18 plus programs. Okay. Um, I'm going to need to look at American Field Exchanges. Service. Okay. American Field Service. So starting, starting with, yeah. Is it some kind of community, is it some kind of charity initiative? Like a volunteer scheme, I guess. Yeah, volunteer based, volunteer based. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. If you email me, uh, then yeah, I'll be happy to link up. And Joel will probably also be happy to link up as well because he's also based in America. Um, assuming you are based in America. Which, if you are based in America, you've gotten it very early, which I appreciate. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm from Germany. Okay, well, I still appreciate you being here. But... <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm curious for those of you online, what kind of LGBTQ matters have come up in your intercultural work? teaching undergrads and bringing up the idea that differences are normal. Yeah, I think that's the classic one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people often think that what's normal is normal, but actually differences are normal. Any other questions for Tom or comments that you'd like to make? We have many program participants who do their exchange. This is following on from the AFS. Uh, we have many program participants who do their exchange who come out or feel free for their first time while on exchange. Yeah, that's actually not too uncommon for people to come out when they are abroad. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly, so one of my experiences is I have international students coming to the UK and they will be out in the UK 
um, but they won't be out um, in the host in their home country. And so they'll come out here and then either they'll try and stay here because they feel they've been accepted in the LGBTQ community here, or they'll have to go back and then going back is a process of going back into the closet, um, which then has its own issues about mental health um, and kind of issues around family acceptance and family expectations. Working in a mixed office created a book on sexual orientation in the workplace that is still relevant to our surprise. Oh. When was when was it made? Would it still be irrelevant? I'll come back when I get an answer to that. Uh, oh, 25 years ago. Wow. Okay. Wow. That would have been, yeah, early 90s. Yeah. 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 I mean, it depends on where the workplace was. Um, some of the general rules, I think, are still true. But one thing I was surprised at was I was recently reading history of LGBT people, people in the unions, work unions in the UK, labor unions, and finding that a lot of the things that they were complaining for in the 80s only then became a law when you had a Labour government in 1997 and afterwards in 2000. So the ideas were there, it's just they weren't in the mainstream. Uh, back up. I feel that a way to include LGBTQ questions in intercultural trainings is to insist on the importance of having an intersectional approach on interculturalism. I feel we too often work to develop intercultural sensitivity on some questions and forget others. Maybe something for research work. Yeah, um, just to explain intersectionality because not everyone understands that. Intersectionality is when you identify with more than one particular group. So for example, um, say if you're black and a lesbian, then you have an intersect of two different kind of identities there. One is as a, say for example, a racial group or a racial minority in, in some countries, and then also as a, a, a minority in terms of your sexual identity. And intersectionality is really important um, to consider, um, not just in the LGBT community where um, often, for example, the white male gay culture is dominant, predominant um, unfortunately but also um, in other areas so for example if you're disabled or if you're part of a religious minority and so intersectionality I think is a really useful way of kind of looking at intercultural communication because the traditional route which or the traditional way of teaching intercultural communication was you know this is one nationality this is another nationality how do we get those two to talk to each other Whereas actually people identify with lots of different social groups and um, other types of groups. And you don't just talk about the one group, you talk about all the groups that you're a part of. Yeah, it's a very good way of avoiding generalizations when you talk about intercourse. Yeah. Fascinating. Another comment, <laughs> issues that have come up for me, deciding to go back into the closet for a position abroad mentoring LGBTQ folks who are junior, teaching my colleagues to think about normativity, avoiding bias, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a similar thing when I went to teach in Japan. I was, I uh, couldn't be, I couldn't be out whilst I was in Japan. I was teaching young children in a rural area. And had I been out, then they may have kind of the typical stereotypes about gay men and being paedophiles or whatever would have, um, would have come to the surface and it could have affected my job. So I didn't do it. Um, there is obviously the counter argument that being out with your presence and may make other people more comfortable to come out, but coming out is always a personal decision. Uh, mentoring LGBTQ folks who are junior, um, again, that's uh, assuming that you're also LGBTQ, that can be difficult because um, no one 
or not everyone in the LGBTQ community agrees with each other. Often, like everyone else, people have different priorities. Um, and so that can be quite a challenge. I'm not sure what advice there is to give there. And then the last thing, which was about teaching colleagues about normativity and biases. Um, one thing that kind of I find difficult is, is situations where I'm, say if I'm gay and there's been something homophobic, the fact that I have to explain to everyone why what, what happened was homophobic or why it was wrong. Whereas it'd be much easier if there was an ally. So this is something that allies can do is to stand up or to make the point for me. Because often it can be exhausting if you're part of this community having to explain why something is, you know, prejudiced or stereotyping and why you're not comfortable with that. And having an ally in the workplace who isn't part of, isn't necessarily part of your community or by definition of being an ally isn't part of your community, but will take your side and will help explain it to other people is really useful. Well, Tom, thank you. You're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat. It's at the top of the hour. So uh, one person said, wish we could continue talking, could continue longer. And hope to hear more in the future. Well, be involved in the future. Check out the website, subscribe to the mailing list, keep informed and contribute. Really, We would really appreciate that. So I'm going to bring the webinar to a close. Again, thank you very much for attending. You will get a follow-up email tomorrow. I have included the link for the feedback form. We would appreciate your feedback on the webinar. And also be watching for announcements on the next webinar, which is uh, June 8th, Friday, June 8th. Michael Boyle will be the presenter. And the topic is companies are striving to be flexible and are surprised when they run into difficulties. Maybe the problem is culture. So tune in to find the answer to that question. Again, more thanks. Loved your presentation in Dublin. Okay, so you've got a following. <laughs> thanks, very interesting and inspiring. So good feedback so far. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Wish you well with it.